Good morning. We'll go ahead and get started. And thanks to the stalwart group who made it here. Um, obviously, I'm not Dr. Roman again. He is um, stuck somewhere in an airport. I'm not exactly sure where. So he asked me to uh, perform the introductions this morning. Um, as he usually does, uh, he shares some piece of historical information. He actually sent it to me. So uh, in his honor, I'll go ahead and, and share it with you. Um, and here's what he said. Uh, today, um, in uh, 1636, Santorio Santorio, that's an interesting name. His parents were, weren't very uh, creative, <laughs> died at the age of at, at 74. Um, he was an Italian physician who made the first synthetic study of basal metabolism. And this, I think, is, is pertinent for today's speaker. In his research, he was also the first to employ instruments of precision and to apply quantitative experimental research techniques in the practice of medicine. His adaptation of the pendulum to medical practice to determine pulse rate was probably inspired by his discussions with Galileo on the latter's experiments with pendulums in 1602. His most famous medical contribution uh, was the ba balance to, uh, to use to study the metabolic changes undergone by his experimental subjects, who included Galileo. He published descriptions of a new type of thermometer, which may well have been inspired by Galileo's, Galileo's thermoscope. So that happened. Uh, this uh, gentleman died in uh, uh, 1636. Don't know if it was this cold and snowy there. Um, this morning's lecture is very special. It is a named lectureship, and you all have hopefully the flyer about um, the Nancy Middleton um, Smith lecture. Um, I've been here um, at the university for 17 years now, and I've always uh, enjoyed hearing this story about uh, grandmother Nancy Middleton Smith. Um, I won't repeat what's on the flyer, but I think it would be really interesting to read this. Um, and uh, because she suffered from cardiopulmonary disease and died prematurely, um, the family has um, uh, funded this name lectureship, which switches uh, each year between cardiology and pulmonary. And so this year, we're very happy that um, it is being sponsored by our cardiology division. And I will invite uh, Dr. Roberto Bowley to come up and introduce our speaker. Good morning, and thank you for uh, braving the weather to come to this uh, lecture. So it's my uh, great pleasure today to introduce a very distinguished speaker, Dr. Anthony Rosenzweig from uh, Massachusetts General Hospital. So Tony has essentially spent uh, all of his life at Harvard. Uh, he went to college at Harvard we, where we graduated with a, a degree in biochemistry, then went to medical school at Harvard, did his residency at the Mass General, uh, his cardiology fellowship at the Mass General, and then uh, engaged in a year of research in genetics with the Seidmans, and then in a three-year research fellowship at the Brigham with uh, Dr. Michael Jim Brown in vascular biology. He was then appointed assistant professor at Harvard and rose, <coughs> rose through the ranks to <coughs> full professor. And this year he was awarded the Paul Dudley White Professor of Medicine uh, uh, Endowment. Um, he has uh, covered uh, several important uh, administrative responsibilities as director of the program in uh, gene therapy at the Mass General, director of cardiovascular research at Beth Israel, director of research in the Cardiovascular Institute at Beth Israel, and this year was uh, appointed uh, chief of cardiology at the Massachusetts General Hospital, where he's also director of uh, cardiovascular research. So uh, Tony is the epitome of the triple threat, which is uh, uh, now uh, becoming increasingly rare. He manages to uh, 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 direct and orchestrate a very successful research program, uh, along with uh, mentoring and teaching, and continuing to perform clinical service. Uh, and uh, that is really one of the few uh, that uh, continues to do this in uh, academic cardiology nowadays. He has been uh, um, recognized in many, uh, many ways. He has been uh, on the editorial boards of all major journals, was associate editor of the New England General Medicine, and uh, he's on the editorial board of Circulation Research. 
uh, he has uh, received uh, uh, several uh, NIH grants. He was also the American coordinator of a LEDUC grant, which is a transatlantic collaboration between uh, American and European scientists, a very competitive and uh, prestigious award. And uh, uh, he is a member of the American Society for Clinical Investigation and the Association of American Physicians, which are the two most prestigious societies to which an American physician could belong. Uh, he, uh, his research has focused on heart failure, uh, particularly on the molecular basis of cardiac dysfunction during heart failure. Uh, in his early days, he was uh, instrumental in uh, uh, in promoting the idea that uh, gene therapy with calcium handling proteins, particularly CERCA2, can be beneficial in heart failure. He did these studies back in the 90s with Dr. Ro Roger Hajar, who is now the Director of Cardiovascular Research at the Mount Sinai. Uh, and those studies were pivotal in laying the groundwork for the current trials of uh, <coughs> CERCA2 gene transfer in patients with heart failure. He has elucidated the role of AKT and TI3 kinase in heart failure and uh, uh, recently has developed uh, this very intriguing idea that exercise can uh, regenerate cardiac uh, muscle and that, that will be the topic of his uh, discussion today. He has published over 150 papers in uh, high impact journals, JCI, Nature, Nature Medicine, uh, Cell Metabolism, Circulation Research, uh, PNAS, uh, New England Journal of Medicine. He's a member of uh, several review boards and, uh, and has delivered uh, lectures at essentially every major uh, meeting nationally and internationally. So uh, in the interest of time, I will close here. We are very honored to have him here and we look forward to his uh, lecture today. Thank, Thank you very much. You much. Thank you. Roberto, thank you so much for that too kind introduction. It's going to be very hard to live up to that, um, but I appreciate it. And thanks for the invitation to participate. I'm honored to uh, be chosen for, to deliver the Nancy Middleton Smith lecture. Um, and thanks to all of you who uh, were the stalwarts who managed to brave the, the weather and, and come here. I have to apologize because obviously I brought this weather from Boston with me. Um, but it was awfully nice of you to make me feel right at home by getting a foot of snow. Um, so uh, what I was going to talk about today, which is, I, I also apologize, is really essentially the same thing I talked about yesterday, is in a growing interest in the lab, which is, can we use the exercised heart as a model of cardiovascular health to try to identify potentially beneficial pathways um, rather than, or as a complement to studying the diseased heart um, as a way of identifying what goes wrong in the heart. Um, and just to frame a little bit of the clinical context, which I think is, is probably superfluous for this audience, but you know, heart failure obviously remains a, a, a large, actually growing unmet clinical need. And this is a, a, a figure from a New England Journal paper some years ago showing the prognosis after an index hospitalization. So first hospitalization for heart failure over years, you can see this is five years, and the survival at this time was somewhat below 40%, so on the order of bad malignancies. Um, the other thing that this uh, figure shows is they divided, this is from the Mayo Clinic, people into heart failure who had the classic reduced ejection fraction and those who have preserved ejection fraction, or what we now call HEFPEF, um, which constitutes about half of the patients with heart failure that we see. And I think surprisingly at this time was the finding that the, the survival curves were virtually superimposable. So I think most of us clinically thought that folks with you know, very low ejection fractions, we recognized that they did poorly. Um, but the fact that these people were doing just as poorly um, was a bit of a surprise. Again, it's a little bit of an unfair comparison because that tends to be an older population, more likely to be female and have a different set of comorbidities. But still, I think that it was so poor was surprising. And the key point here is that we still have no proven therapies for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So none of the therapies, although we can sometimes make people feel better, have been shown to actually improve outcomes in that population. So a huge segment of the heart failure population, we really still have no effective therapies for. Even for people with uh, reduced ejection fraction, we obviously do have a handful of proven therapies that improve outcome, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor um, um, blockers, and so on, mineralocorticoids. And this is 
uh, figure from the Rawls trial, which was a pivotal trial published in 1999, showing that spironolactone, a mineralocorticoid antagonist, actually quite dramatically improved overall survival. I think, again, a little bit surprising, and led to the approval by the FDA of mineralocorticoids about four years later, so in 2003. But again, I think the key point is that all of these therapies mostly slow the progression of disease rather than restoring normal function or structure to the heart. And secondly, um, it's important to realize that this was the last conceptually new class of drugs. Now, we've had some successes with devices since then. We've had some derivatives of other drugs or combinations of drugs like Vidal, but um, essentially mineralocorticoids antagonists approved in 2003, roughly, um, so over a decade ago was the last time we had a new drug. So there's a substantial unmet clinical need, which is compounded by the fact that heart failure is actually anticipated to increase for several reasons. So first of all, not always appreciated is that heart failure, particularly perhaps heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, is closely linked to metabolic disease and obesity. So this is another paper from the New England Journal that Tommy Wang did showing that um, across a range of BMIs, the, the, the uh, rate, the incident rate of heart failure, so new heart failure cases in both men and women goes up as you go from normal to overweight to ob obese uh, subjects over a period of time. Um, and so I think we all recognize that you know, there's a growing epidemic of obesity and metabolic disease in the United States, so this is also likely to contribute. So when I came through Louisville, I saw um, the golden version of uh, Michelangelo's David, which was obviously sort of an idealized version of a, a man, you know, um, some centuries ago. And many people have suggested that if this were to be revisited today, it would look more like this. Um, and so, and this David would be at higher risk for heart failure and, and metabolic disease, obviously. In addition to that, you know, our, our populations are aging. So heart failure is closely linked to aging and the demographics of our populations are aging. And so heart failure for some years has been the most common um, diagnosis in the Medicare population. So people over the age of 65. And as these populations age, the anticipation so is that... It, that it's, 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 it's <laughs> as in this um, uh, editorial that Margaret Redfield wrote, you know, as we anticipate the number of people over the 65 will increase quite dramatically in the coming decades, unless we figure out something to do about heart failure, presumably the amount of heart failure that we're confronting, particularly heart failure with preserved ejection fraction for which we still don't have effective treatments will likely increase as well. So with that as a, a prelude, you know, we and many others have thought it would be important to try to understand and I, you know, what's going on in heart failure, but also try to find ways to identify novel therapeutic targets in this context. And many of you know that heart failure often develops after a period of abnormal growth that's been called pathologic hypertrophy. Um, and really it's a, a little bit circular of a definition, but partly the idea is that pathologic hypertrophy develops in response to pathologic stimuli, things like hypertension or after a heart attack or aortic stenosis. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's often a forerunner that's associated with fibrosis shown here in blue. And patients at this stage are probably at substantial risk for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. It may have diastolic dysfunction and other problems associated with that, but also at risk for arrhythmia. And some of these patients go on to progress to dilation um, and systolic dysfunction, more classic heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. But the heart also grows in response to other stimuli, for example, exercise. So this is a cartoon from Joe Hill and Eric Olson where they've also noted here um, that the heart grows in response to pregnancy, which is also interesting. I would say that, and I'm not gonna have time to go into this, pregnancy and exercise seem to have very different patterns in terms of the gene expression programs. So I usually now don't lump those together because I think they are in fact distinct. And this may relate to things like peripartum cardiomyopathy and other changes that we see um, sometimes with, with pregnancy. But in exercise, the heart grows. The nuances of the patterns as shown here are somewhat different, but in general, that doesn't lead to these adverse sequelae. And so um, this is a picture of Michael Phelps, you know, a, a, an elite, um, high intensity and high uh, endurance athlete. And again, I don't know anything about his medical condition, so this isn't a, a HIPAA violation. I am not involved in his care, but 
but uh, in general, those athletes have very large stroke volumes, very large hearts, and most of the time don't go on to develop these adverse sequelae. One exception to that may well be that atrial fibrillation does appear to be a little more common in, in athletes, endurance athletes, and there's even some animal data supporting a potential mechanistic role. And an interesting question is, you know, how much exercise is too much exercise? But having said that, in the United States, people are much more likely to suffer from too little exercise um, than too much. Um, and in addition to the fact that exercise doesn't generally lead to these bad things, there's a fair amount of evidence that exercise leads to good things. And this is really tough to get at in a clinical context, so most of the data for that come from epidemiologic studies, which are confounded by other, you know, uh, collinear behaviors. People who exercise tend to be more co health conscious in other ways. Um, and also an enormous amount of self-selection. So people who exercise um, decide that they're going to exercise, and whether that's a predetermined genetic or environmental influence that may, in fact, uh, cause their risk to be lower is always hard to know. There have been some randomized control trials. It's almost impossible to do a primary prevention randomized control trial for, for, uh, uh, for exercise because people don't stick with the regimens, and the numbers that you would need to do that are enormous. But there have been secondary prevention um, and interventional trials, and probably the best one to date was published in JAMA. So just to show that I do sometimes show figures that don't come from the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, but this was, uh, I think, a very nice study that where they randomized 2,300 heart failure patients. So you can imagine the complexity of trying to take 2,300 um, patients and, and randomize them to either a structured exercise training program um, or, or just their usual level of activity. And um, in terms of overall survival, it's hard to see these curves, but there was a very modest benefit that really just missed statistical significance. So this p-value is 0.06. And then the authors made the argument that there were baseline differences in the characteristics of the subjects, and so if they adjusted for those, it actually was statistically significant, although that's obviously not something that we typically do for randomized controlled trials, where the randomization should take care of that, especially with these numbers. There was a more substantial improvement in quality of life using this typical heart failure, um, uh, Minnesota living with heart failure um, uh, instrument. But I guess I show this, I mean, it's a, 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 a hint from a randomized controlled trial of benefits even in a heart failure population where we used to think maybe this would be hazardous, so there's certainly no indication that this is harmful. Um, but also to illustrate, it's really hard to do this kind of study. I mean, again, both because people don't tend to stick with it and probably because the people who I would argue need it the most are least capable of exercising, right? So heart failure patients, you, know, you can gradually improve um, what they do, but they have limited exercise tolerance almost by, by definition. So it's really hard to do this in people. In animals, it's much easier to get hard data that are well controlled, and so this is just one of example of many studies that have demonstrated that exercise, even in young healthy animals, leads to cardiovascular benefit and protection. This is from John Calvert, um, who's at Emory, just showing that if you, published in Circulation Research, if you um, take animals that are either sedentary or allowed to run. So mice love to run in general, and so if you give them wheels, and somebody did a study in science last year showing that even if you put a wheel in the, in the wild, mice will find the wheel and, and run voluntarily in this, almost like going to the gym, and they'll self-select to do this. And they found other animals, frogs, snails, other animals seem to like to do this as well. I thought about writing in to point out it wasn't well controlled because they sort of had a little couch with a TV remote control that they could see whether they also preferred to do that. But in any case, there is a sense that they, they in fact, naturally like to run. It's not just a, a product of being in captivity. And if you allow them to run, um, they'll often run five to seven kilometers a night, which is a lot for a little mouse. And then if you induce a stereotyped heart attack by ligating one of the coronary arteries, they actually have smaller infarcts, so there's a cardioprotective effect of this exercise, and that effect persists for up to or a little more than a week after that you make them sedentary again. So there's something, it's not just an acute effect, there's something that reprograms in the heart um, that allows them uh, to have a protective effect, again, that persists, and this is just troponin levels showing that both shortly after the voluntary exercise or while they're still in the throes of this and after being sedentary again for a week, they still have protection. So we thought these things were interesting and again might provide a complementary approach to thinking about can we identify pathways that would be worth targeting in, in heart disease to either prevent
um, or, or treated. And so when we started these studies, we had a number of study questions about how the physiologic and pathologic growth of the heart or the growth of the heart in, in response to these different stimuli actually differed. And the first most fundamental one is whether they were really different. And again, many people have pointed out that, that if, even if you're Michael Phelps, you exercise four or five hours a day, which is quite intense, but it's not 24 hours a day. And if you have aortic stenosis, it's there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so maybe it's just a question of a tipping point of pushing it uh, too, too far. So a quantitative difference rather than a fundamental qualitative difference. And then exercise obviously does lots of beneficial things systemically. So it changes your vasculature, it changes your skeletal muscle, it changes your metabolism. And maybe that is the basis of the benefits that we see in the cardiovascular system. And undoubtedly, I think with patients, a lot of the benefits we see to exercise training really do come from peripheral conditioning and their ability to be more functional um, rather than something necessarily that changes in the heart. So we wondered whether there were, in fact, any intrinsic pathways that were specific to the heart that might, in fact, be modulated by exercise and were in, in contributing to the benefits. And then, of course, we were interested if there were, could we identify those pathways and learn how to exploit them potentially for for clinical benefit eventually, but even in animal models. And so, um, as you all know, there are lots of different ways to kind of take two states, the physiologic growth and the pathologic growth of the heart, and study every gene or every metabolite or, or every um, uh, molecules of different classes to understand what's, what's different. And so this is just one such system. Um, I have no conflict of interest with Affymetrix, but they make these little chips that are about the size of your thumb, and you can, you can quickly catalog 40,000 different gene expressions on this uh, uh, little chip and then derive something called a heat map which shows just in color coding here the genes that go up or the genes that go down and at least begin to describe what's different. So, so this is actually not the system we used to, to do this catalog but it's an illustration of the, of the idea that there are so many technologies now that are powerful to allow us to, to catalog what the differences are. So, so we were interested in looking at elite athletes like Michael Phelps and saying what's different about their hearts compared to people who, you know, might develop heart failure or have pathologic hypertrophy. And as I said yesterday, you know, our entreaties to Michael Phelps went unanswered. He was not interested in donating part of his heart for some reason to these studies. So we turned to another group of uh, elite athletes uh, shown here. Um, they don't actually get these little floaties, but this is a picture of the medical student who worked on this found. But we do swim them like Michael Phelps, and we swim them almost as rigorously as Michael Phelps. So they start out 10 minutes twice a day, and this is day one of the swimming. And then, um, uh, you know, they're not natural swimmers, so you have to watch them carefully, otherwise the swimming model turns into a drowning model. S some of them are smarter than the others and cling to the little thermometer and are lazy or smarter and they decide not to do it. So we're not so interested in, in those um, either. But there's a solid cadre who will exercise and then you can train them. And eventually, by the end of about two weeks, they're doing 90 minutes twice a day. So they're swimming three hours a day. So again, not quite Michael Phelps level, but, but pretty intense. So that's the first thing to acknowledge is that this is an intense model and it's also somewhat stressful for the animals. So everything I'm going to show you here um, we've confirmed in running models as well where again they do this voluntarily. You can see one of them just got rescued by Nina who's the medical student was doing this. And so we decided to compare that to a classic model of, of pathologic um, induced hypertrophy, the so-called pressure overload or transverse aortic constriction model. And but, but what we did was to study this very early. So we looked at two weeks because we know that later on these mice will develop dysfunction, programmed cell death, fibrosis, lots of changes in the heart um, that will be different. But what we wanted to do was look very early when these were very much the same. And so really we looked at this period of two weeks and it turned out fortuitously that the hearts had grown just about exactly the same amount, about 25% increase in, in heart mass. The function was normal by echo. There wasn't any fibrosis in this, in either model, but particularly in this model. And the capillary density was similar. So we really thought they were comparing apples and apples. So these hearts, as best we could tell by echo or, or gross uh, and histologic means, looked the same. Um, and then we compared those using a number of different profiling approaches. And just to summarize the, the published work, what I'll do is kind of summarize what I thought were the interesting take-home messages from that and then talk a little bit about some stuff that's not published or, or that's going to be in, 
uh, in press coming out relatively soon. And so this work was published some years ago, but just to summarize what I thought was most interesting, the first thing was that the profiles are really almost completely distinct, and I'll show you that. So even at this stage when the hearts look nearly identical, as best we can tell, um, the genetic programs, at least at the level of uh, a comprehensive look at every transcription factor in the mouse genome, are completely different. The second thing, which was not one of our a priori hypotheses, but came out of this, was that when we looked at the transcription factors that we pulled out of this, there was a relative prevalence, I mean, still a minority, but more transcription factors linked to cell cycle progression in the exercised hearts than in the TAC hearts or in any of the control hearts. So the TAC hearts were up a tiny bit, like 2%, but in the exercised heart, the number of transcription factors linked in other systems, not in the heart, but to cell cycle progression was about 13%. So again, that was not something we were expecting, but led us to an interesting hypothesis, which Roberto alluded to, that we'll, we'll, we'll come back to in a minute. And then the first, third thing is a particular pathway, which we think looks interesting, and I'll show you some of those data, and, and worth pursuing more. So just to show some of the data behind this, if you plot all the genes that change either up or down in the exercise model or up or down in the aortic constriction model, you're shown here on a on a dot plot on base two, I think you can see most things don't change, so they're right around the origin. If you squint, there's sort of a vague sense that these actually go in, in a direction saying they're, they're actually inversely correlated. They're certainly not correlated, and there is a statistically significant but quite weak inverse correlation that's partly driven by some of these outliers that actually change in both models but change in opposite directions, so for example, you know, substantially up, again, this is base two, so two to the fourth up in exercise versus down in, in pressure overload. So again, can't really answer the philosophical question, but on some level suggests that these are really qualitatively different states at a very early stage, again, at least at the transcription factor regulation um, level, and consistent with work that Howard Rockman had published actually some years ago, which was really beautiful work, where he f figured out a way to make an intermittent aortic banding model, so he had a balloon that he would inflate so he could match the amount of time that animals spent with their aortic constricted versus the amount of time they exercised. And even when you match the time, again, you get a more pathologic pattern of gene expression um, with the constriction model compared to exercise. And then the second point, which again we thought was interesting, and obviously from, from Professor, uh, Professor Bowley's work and, and the work of others, we now know, in contrast to what I learned when I was in medical school, there's some capacity for um, regeneration in the adult heart, not only in animals, but even in humans. And this was a study from the Karolinska um, where they used nuclear fallout. And the idea that, as, as frightening as this sounds, for those of us who were alive during nuclear testing, a little bit of radio-labeled carbon-14 got in, we breathed in as carbon dioxide, and it got into our DNA if we were synthesizing DNA. And so by making careful quantitative measurements and a whole series of biological controls, they were able to show that there's a rate of birth of new cardiac myocytes in an autopsy series that happens after the birth of the individual. And in a 20-year-old, in their studies, it was about a 1% per year rate, but still, conceptually, the notion that there's some regeneration or some generation of new cardiac myocytes in an adult human heart, I think, was, you know, uh, fascinating and obviously something that people like Piero and Versa have been uh, advocating for, for years. So when we went back and looked in the SWUM hearts, and this is just a subset of the markers we looked at, every marker we looked at that's indicative of cell cycle progression and proliferation was increased. So this is BRDU, which is a thymidine analog, so that's incorporated into cells that are synthesizing DNA or, or repairing DNA, and so that was increased. Other markers like KI67, but also Aurora B kinase, which is a kinase that's required for cytokinesis and turns on relatively late in, the, in, in, in uh, mitosis. But the key thing is, you know, first off, I, I, I think we have to be careful, although these were all increased and all increased in cells that had sarcomere protein expression, so indicative of something in the cardiomyocyte lineage, this doesn't prove that this resulted in the formation of new cardiomyocytes, or even if it did, that those new cardiomyocytes survive and integrate into the heart and become an important functional component of the heart. So that's, an, uh, uh, in my mind, a working hypothesis that we're quite interested in pursuing and, and currently trying to pursue in long-term studies with Rich Lee using a kind of mass spec-based imaging approach that he's, he's taken. So I don't know the answer to that, but, but I think will be quite interesting. And, 
And again, my hypothesis would be in the short term, this doesn't explain the benefits of exercise. But in the long term, for animals or people who habitually exercise, could this be part of the contribution um, uh, to benefits that we see? And part of the reason I think this is interesting is because there is a literature that many of you probably know from people like Rusty Gage in San Diego um, in animal models, uh, suggesting that exercise is one of the few physiologic cues that can drive the birth of new neurons um, in the brain. And so again, the brain, like the heart, when I was in school, we were taught is post-mitotic, terminally differentiated. There's no possibility of growing new neurons. And again, I would say the bulk of the evidence suggests that's not true. And that in fact, quite well documented, there's a population of, of progenitor cells in the brain that's marked by a specific transcription factor that gets turned on in response to exercise and other cues and generates new neurons in the anterior hippocampus. Of course, it's again, hard to know if this happens in people, but I was really uh, blown away by this study that was published in PNAS a few years ago where they took middle-aged folks around 55 and randomized, who were healthy, but randomized them to either a structured exercise, walking, I think it was 40 minutes a day uh, for three days a week, or their usual activities. And the people who exercised over a period of a year in quantitative MRI me measurements had an increase in the volumes of this similar anterior hippocampus area compared to the people who didn't exercise. And then they correlated that with improvement on uh, various memory task um, uh, tests. And so again, doesn't prove that's from regeneration, but certainly raises that intriguing possibility that there's a parallel. And um, so we'll come back to this at the end, but this notion that maybe exercise drives a similar process in multiple tissues is certainly intriguing and, and could be useful. And then finally, the, the, the pathway that we identified is shown here and through some uh, signaling molecules that we've been interested in for a while, AKT1, which is known to be required for um, the physiologic growth of the heart in response to exercise. So AKT1 knockout mice don't grow at all in response to exercise. There's a series of a transcription factors, CBP beta, which decreases, and then that relieves repression on another transcription factor called cited 4 um, that we think is an important part of this. Um, so, you know, at the time that we published this paper, uh, we actually had a knockout model for CBP beta and showed that that recapitulated much of the exercise phenotype. Um, so CBP beta goes down about twofold in exercised hearts. And so the heterozygous knockout mice model that almost perfectly, about a twofold reduction. And those mice have at baseline slightly better than normal cardiac function, slight increase in cardiac size, and are actually protected against heart failure. Um, but it did look like cited 4 was the downstream effector, at least in vitro. And so we really didn't know anything about what that did uh, in vivo. At the time, there were only seven PubMed references. And so we were quite interested in understanding more about this. And so what I'm going to share with you now are two interrelated stories about in vivo effects of these pathways that are really uh, new. And, and, and this one is unpublished. Um, so uh, in order to address what happens in vivo, Vasilios Bezaridis, who's an MD-PhD, actually pediatric cardiologist, quite interested in the physiologic growth of the heart, working with two students, Kavya Parachuri, who's a Sarnoff fellow, was a Sarnoff fellow in the lab, now is a resident at Tufts Medical Center, and Nina Mann, who was an HST, MIT Health Sciences Technology um, a student in the lab, who's now a resident at, at Children's Hospital in Boston, um, decided to make a mouse in which we could specifically turn on cited 4 in cardiomyocytes in response to um, manipulating an antibiotic, doc doxycycline. So this is a system that Jeff Robbins invented some years ago. And basically, it involves two transgenic mice um, that we breed together and then have a system where if we feed them doxycycline, you suppress the expression of this gene. And if you take away the doxycycline from their food, you turn on the gene only in cardiac myocytes. And we turn it on. This just shows it happens specifically in cardiomyocytes, but also to make the point that when you exercise, probably your cited four goes up, or at least in mice, it goes up in the heart about two to three fold. These mice go up substantially more than that, but on the other hand, not a crazy amount more. So it's not, you have to be careful in transgenic systems that it's not a hundred fold more, which would obviously be completely unrealistic, but it's a bit of a caricature of what might happen in response to exercise. So we now have a mouse that we can allow to develop normally, have just normal gene expression, and then as an adult mouse, we can take away the doxycycline, turn on cited 4, and say what happens. And so what happens is they recapitulate much of the exercise phenotype. So the hearts get bigger. Um, the function remains normal. They don't develop fibrosis. The increase in 
in heart size is entirely explainable by an increase in cardiomyocyte size, which again, almost always over short periods of time, this is three weeks, changes in heart size are related to changes in cardiomyocyte size. And if you do the math, at least the back of the envelope math, this is sufficient to explain the change in heart mass overall. And the pattern of gene expression is very much a physiologic or exercise uh, related increase. So for example, things like the isoforms of the myosin heavy chain, uh, in exercise you get an increase in alpha to beta myosin heavy chain ratio, and that's in fact what we see in these mice. CBP beta, which I've told you goes down in exercise, goes down in these mice. Most of this is consistent except for PGC1 um, alpha, which uh, actually goes down in, in these mice, and we think the reason for that is it looks like PGC1, at least to some extent, regulates expression of cytophore, and this is a negative feedback loop when you overexpress lots of cytophore. So the hearts are a little bit bigger, they grow, and, and their function is normal. So again, looking a little bit like an exercise heart, so what ha happens when we stress them? Remember, as I told you at the beginning, exercise protects against initial injury, and actually there's a separate literature that protects against remodeling um, after in ischemic injury. And so we were interested in looking at those um, issues, and so we turned on the gene by re removing doxycycline, subjected mice to an ischemia reperfusion injury, and then studied them over a period of about, um, actually about six weeks with echo and, and ultimately sacrificing them. And so the first thing is that in contrast to what I showed you with exercise, turning on sighted forward does not change the initial infarct size. So initially we were disappointed by this, obviously. Um, we were hoping that this would have a dramatic cardioprotective effect, although the more we thought about it, I mean, there have been a number of interventions that mediate cardioprotection, and those have been very hard to translate clinically because uh, it's, people don't usually call you before their heart attack and say, if you could give me that now, maybe uh, tomorrow I'll have a heart attack. Um, so, and then we looked at what happens in remodeling, and the interesting thing there is, although by echo, the dysfunction we see at 24 hours, similar to the infarct size at 24 hours, is no different, over the ensuing weeks, so this is four weeks, the site of four expressing mice actually recover function, not actually quite back to normal, but compared to controls which stay about the same, this is in an FVB background, um, they actually get substantially better and they have better survival overall after this ischemic injury. And that's associated with a substantial decrease in the amount of fibrosis that they um, develop, again, over a, a period of weeks. Interestingly, the functional recovery is actually quite quick. So over a period of a week or two, you can see in these serial measurements, they've already gotten quite a bit better by one week and really you know, dramatically better by, well, sorry, this is one week and they sort of sustain that. These are not different from each other. Um, and there's an associated decrease in, in lung weight that's just uh, borderline and uh, not quite statistically significant, but suggests there may be a difference in, in pulmonary congestion, which we use as a sur surrogate for heart failure. So, you know, again, just to summarize this interim uh, stuff, cited for, you know, is sufficient to both recapitulate the physiologic cardiac growth that we see similar in pattern to what we see with exercise, and also protects against adverse remodeling after ischemic injury without changing the initial infarct size, which again, we think is interesting and potentially clinically relevant if we can find a way um, to mani manipulate this pathway uh, in vivo, um, because again, it's probably much more feasible to think about targeting adverse remodeling as compared to trying to mediate an impact on the initial infarct size. Having said that, you know, we, Roberto and I were talking um, a, a, a couple of nights ago. I do agree that exercise is likely multifactorial in terms of the benefits that it mediates. And so it's unlikely that there's going to be one pill that mimics what you see in exercise. Although somebody in the lab found this on the internet and it is called exercise in a pill. And again, this is not an off-label uh, recommendation. It's only calcium pyruvate. I can't imagine that it actually does anything um, particularly beneficial, so I'm not recommending it. And I think for those of us who can exercise, we should exercise. And so this cartoon where the doctor says, what fits your busy schedule better, exercising one hour a day or being dead 24 hours a day? is probably a reasonable philosophy, but obviously most of our patients or many of our patients can't exercise or can't exercise with the intensity that, that we might like, and so the hope is that by identifying some of the pathways involved, we may be able to learn how to manipulate those um, to a way that would benefit our patients or maybe even in some specific instance mediate some of these benefits um, more dramatically than we can achieve with the usual kind of exercise. Um, so, so now for the remaining few minutes, I was going to talk about a slightly different but interrelated story that also came out of these exercise studies, and you'll see they kind of converge at the end. But when we thought about 
the, the fact that we had found something interesting by, by using a platform specifically tailored to transcription factors, we thought, well, what else are we missing on the traditional microarrays? And so a whole class of molecules that you're probably all aware of that, you know, um, uh, you know that that Mello was awarded the Nobel Prize for some some years ago are these small non-coding um, uh, RNAs called microRNAs, and so we thought, well, it would be interesting to look at those again in these exercise models. And this time, did a slightly different um, model where what we did was to not compare the physiologic and pathologic, but take two physiologic um, um, growth models, the swimming model and the running model, and catalog every, at the time, uh, you know, 641, there are more known now, microRNAs um, in these uh, systems and say what's dynamically regulated in each of these models. Um, and you can see, interestingly, there's a, a solid set of common microRNAs that change in both, and I argued those are likely to be the most robust mechanisms, but there are some that are unique to either the swimming model or the running model, which may, in, in fact, be interesting in their own right. And so of these, we then took those and validated them in, in independent samples and then looked at simple um, functional readouts in cardiomyocytes to see if they looked interesting. And I'll tell you, the first one that has emerged from this screen is a microRNA called MIR222. And just to show some of the first initial screen, if we, if we put this into cardiac myocytes, we get an increase in cell size and we get an increase. These are neonatal cardiomyocytes, so much more able to proliferate than adult cardiomyocytes. We get an increase in proliferation. It's very highly conserved, so that suggests it may be important in evolution since it goes all the way um, you know, back to very uh, primitive species. And when we look at the gene expression that it induces in cardiomyocytes, it's very much a physiologic or apparently beneficial pattern. So things like AMP or BMP, which obviously we use clinically as markers of heart failure, go down fairly dramatically. And again, that ratio of alpha to beta myosin heavy chain goes up quite dramatically because alpha goes up and beta goes down. And so we thought it was interesting for those reasons, but we also thought it was interesting because Aaron Bagish, who's actually a very good clinical investigator at Mass General, had been interested in exercise for a long time and did a study of rowers that was published some years before, completely independent of our work, where he found that MIR222, by looking at a handful of microRNAs, was one that goes up in healthy young rowers, both um, after an acute bout of exercise and also with chronic exercise training. And, and this is in the, in the serum or plasma of, of rowers. And so the notion that not only were we finding this going up in the hearts of animals who exercise, but in people who exercise, you see this go up in their plasma, at least encouraged us that there may be some relevance for human biology. Um, of course, it doesn't say that what's in the plasma came from the heart, it could come from other sources, or that what's in the plasma is functionally relevant. I'm not gonna show the data, but we've since looked at heart failure patients who exercised and also found that it goes up in heart failure patients. Again, just kind of intriguing circumstantial evidence. So the nice thing about microRNAs is there's a relatively easy way to test whether they're doing anything functional. So there are chemically modified nucleic acids that are very effective inhibitors of these microRNAs called lock nucleic acid antimers that Eric Olson and other people have, have used uh, to great effect. And so we um, got a lock nucleic an acid antimer, so an antagonist to MIR222, and treated animals with it and said, well, well, how does that change the exercise response over a period of three weeks? And so you can see here that when some of the labels <laughs> fell off, but it, when you exercise mice, again, as expected, the, the heart weight to body weight increases. This label is supposed to say the control antimer, so just a scrambled sequence that otherwise has the same nucleic acids in it. it has no effect, but if you use the specific antagonist, you completely block the growth of the heart in response to exercise, suggesting that MIR222 is necessary for, at least over the short term, this growth of the heart in response to exercise. And then once again, this is paralleled by, paralleled by changes in, in cardiomyocyte size. So again, when you exercise mice, their individual cardiomyocytes on cross sections, or if you isolate the cardiomyocytes, get bigger. But if you treat them with the specific antagomere or this LNA antimere to MIR222, you block that completely. So again, the growth of the cardiomyocyte in vivo, in hearts, and the growth of the heart, at least over this three-week period, um, is, is blocked completely if you block um, MIR222. And, and I'm not showing the data, but MIR222 levels really plummet with this treatment in the hearts of these mice. And then, you know, as I mentioned, you know, we have some evidence that markers of proliferation go up in exercise in the heart. So we looked at that as well. And you know, just showing one of the markers, phosphohistone H3, 
uh, does go up again, as we've seen previously with, with um, exercises as specifically in the cardiomyocyte um, lineage, not changed by the control antimere, but dampened, although not completely blocked by this specific um, anti-222 um, uh, uh, inhibitor. So then we were interested in saying, well, so it's MIR-222 appears to be necessary for some of these um, uh, physiologic responses to exercise. Is it sufficient to mediate some of these responses? So we made, again, another mouse where we can turn it on or turn it off in response to doxycycline and only specifically in cardiomyocytes. And again, this just shows that we can turn it on when we, when we have the right genotype and we take away the doxycycline. And here, again, it goes up a, you know, somewhere between three and three and a half fold which is a little bit more, so this probably goes up normally in the mouse heart about one and a half or two times. So again, it's a little bit exaggerated, but not dramatically so. And so the first thing that's interesting, at least to me, is that the mice are normal at baseline. So when you turn this on, there's actually no change. So in contrast to cited four, the hearts don't grow, the hearts don't look abnormal in any way. We can't tell that it's been turned on. Um, and again, that was initially disappointing, although interesting in the sense of having this kind of um, background level of MIR-222 to say that that's not sufficient by itself. There are other signals induced by exercise that must be involved. On the other hand, if we then subject those mice to stress, similar to the cited four story, actually what we see is that the, the transgenic mice are, you know, diet, have less dysfunction, so less of a reduction in their, um, in their uh, fractional shortening shown here at six weeks less dilation and substantially less fibrosis or scarring that occurs in the heart, again, at a, over a period of six weeks. And those changes are uh, paralleled by these changes in proliferation markers. Again, not proven that this really results in cardiomyogenesis. So, so EDU is up specifically in the cardiomyocyte lineage, actually down in the fibroblast lineage consistent with less, or non-cardiomyocytes consistent with less fibrosis. Um, uh, here, just an, another marker, the phosphohistone H3. And then there's also less programmed cell death in the hearts that are expressing MIR-222. Um, so, of course, we're quite interested in exactly how this works. And so the nice thing about microRNAs is there are bioinformatic ways to predict what their targets are. And so we cross-reference two of those analyses with uh, expression data, looking at cardiomyocytes overexpressing MIR-222 and pulled out four um, potential targets for this, one of which P27 is a cell cycle inhibitor, so interesting in that context, already shown to regulate cell cycle progression in cardiomyocytes and adult hearts in, in mice, and already a known target of MIR-222, so sort of internal validation, but then also three other novel targets, two novel kinases, HIPK1 and 2, and a transcriptional repressor. Without going into details, we can show that these are all direct targets of MIR-222 by engineering constructs where we mutate the binding site and the regulation goes away. Um, and then what's particularly interesting to me is they look like they have different biological effects. So I think we're beginning to get the sense that we can divide or parse out the effects of MIR-222 on things like the hypertrophy or the growth in cell size, the proliferation and the survival, and that different downstream targets probably mediate these different effects. And so just again showing some of those data, if you so when, when the microRNA targets a gene, the expression goes down. So homeobox 1 goes down. If we just knock down homeobox 1, that's sufficient to increase cell size. If we knock down either P27 or HIPK1, you increase cell proliferation, again, in neonatal cardiomyocytes. And so then finally, we were interested in knowing, you know, are these two things related? And so these are the direct targets of MIR-222, but an indirect consequence of MIR-222 expressions that cited for goes up. And that seems to be downstream of two of the targets. So if, home, if you knock down homeobox 1, you get an increase in cited 4. If you knock down P27, which is also CDK1B, um, uh, uh, you get an increase in cited 4. So we would just amend the pathway that we originally um, um, published by saying that it looks like MIR-222 is upstream and through two of its direct targets regulates cited 4, which ultimately we think contributes to probably both the cardioprotection um, and the uh, growth of the heart, although again, MIR-222 isn't sufficient by itself, so there must be other signals, you know, that contribute in, in some important way. So, so again, just to summarize and wrap up, because time is running out, the, probably the most important thing to take away from this is that, you know, the heart grows in response to a range of stimuli, some of which are pathologic, some of which are physiologic, but the outcomes are quite different. And it, at, at early stage, when the hearts look almost identical, 
expression profiling suggests that there are really different genetic programs um, that are almost complete, not entirely distinct, but almost completely uh, distinct. And then intriguingly, you know, again, not expected by us, there were markers of cardiomyocyte proliferation that increase in response to exercise. And, and certainly one of the things we're interested in pursuing is, is this a clue where we might be able to identify endogenous pathways that drive this limited but, but real capacity of the heart to repair um, or regenerate. And so, you know, identifying those pathways and understanding how we can manipulate them would be interesting. And then within that, you know, we talked specifically about this pathway that involves this microRNA and cited four and appears to um, be an important mediator of the exercise induced growth and at least protection against adverse remodeling, not initial infarct size. So neither of these changes the initial infarct size. And again, there's a well-documented literature saying that exercise re leads to smaller infarcts. So I would hypothesize that has to be a different pathway. And so then just in closing, you know, we've talked a lot about how these states differ, but really what people are often interested in is why are they different, right? So, so you know, and, and as I said yesterday, I mean, cardiologists most commonly say to me, so if part of your heart has a heart attack, isn't the rest of it just exercising more? So why is it that that leads to adverse, you know, scarring, dilation, uh, cell death, whereas exercise seems to be beneficial? And I think part of it, at least, you know, it's hard to always answer a, it's always hard to answer a why question, but teleologically, it makes sense to me that there's a strong evolutionary pressure to select for a beneficial response to exercise, whereas the response to myocardial ischemia probably is not under um, a, a selective pressure. Um, and then, of course, the true physiologists have pointed out to me that there are, in fact, mechanical differences between in the forces and the physiology of an MI versus the kinds of exercise that we're doing. But my own preference is that, and, and bet, is that it's not all hemodynamics, that there are, in fact, circulating factors that engage cell surface receptors or even nuclear receptors that change the response of the cardiomyocyte to these mechanical forces. And along those lines, what we find particularly intriguing is this notion that, I mean, we're hypothesizing that maybe in the heart there's exercise drives a, a some sort of proliferative, potentially regenerative response. I think this is better documented in skeletal muscle. I've even seen papers about bone marrow. But as I've said, really well documented in the brain, which is curious because the brain is obviously not mechanically involved in exercise in the same way that skeletal muscle or the heart is. So it's made us wonder, again, is there some circulating factor that may actually mediate these benefits and can we find that factor either by screening plasma or by looking at conditioned media and we've started some of those experiments. Um, so finally, just let me thank the people who really did the work. So Vasilius Bezaridis is soon to graduate from the lab and sorry, his own lab, MD, PhD, um, pediatric cardiologist. Um, Zhao Jun Liu and Junji Zhao did the uh, microRNA uh, work. Paul Wei's been an undergraduate in the lab contributing to that. And a lot of this work has been a close collaboration with Bruce Spiegelman's lab, who's had an interest in, in exercise in the context of, of um, metabolism. So thanks very much again for the invitation and I'm delighted to answer any questions. So we have wondered about that, um, and again, there's it's it's not just mere two two two. I mean, there's a range of these other things. So whether one will do it or whether a combination is needed is is hard to know. We've started to play a little bit with how we would model that. So it turns out if you take an adenovirus that encodes mere two 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 and just do a Calvane injection, it goes to the liver, and I guess because the liver is quite good at secreting these things, you actually raise level in the, the plasma quite substantially. So. So, you know, we've started to play with that potentially as a model of not what might happen, not with cardiac expression, but with, you know, high circulating levels of MIR-222. But we don't know the answer so far. But I think it's a really interesting question. And then we've wondered about this combination. I mean, ever since the Yamanaka factors, right, everyone, you realize maybe you need multiple signals to mediate. And obviously in MIR-222, it doesn't look like that's sufficient to recapitulate the exercise. So we've worked with uh, a very good synthetic biologist, Kim Liu at MIT, 
who has systems for making libraries with multiple combinations of these microRNAs. And the idea is, you know, can we see more efficiently than just trying, you know, trial and error, which of these might, which combination might be synergistic? But absolutely. <laughs> well, thanks so much. Um, so I, I guess, you know, to, to start with the second uh, part, I mean, there are, you know, I, I'm of course struck, as I think we all are, so, so the 100th anniversary of Paul W. White founding the MGH Cardiac Unit is coming up next year. And so we've kind of been delving a little bit into the history. I never had the opportunity to, to meet him, but, you know, have heard lots of, you know, kind of heartwarming stories about not only how much care and empathy he had for his patients, but, you know, obviously a master clinician. But particularly in this context, what strikes me is how prescient he was thinking about prevention, exercise, you know, diet, you know, and, and it's, it's just so interesting that, you know, a hundred years ago or more, you know, he was already kind of thinking about this and recognized, I think, you know, partly intuitively the benefits of this. The first part is really hard. I mean, I think the truth is, and Aaron Baggish and I have had this conversation a bunch of times, we really don't know the optimal regimen. In, in animals, you know, there's a limited repertoire of what we can get mice to do. So we've tried weightlifting, but they're not particularly excited about that. And um, they take too many breaks and check their smartphones. And, um, so, so, you know, it's very tough to, to know. In the animals, at least in the protocols we followed, we haven't seen, and these are relatively short term, usually three weeks, we haven't seen adverse sequelae despite these very intense protocols. Although, you know, in humans, people have raised that question. And again, most of that is observational data, so it's hard to know whether people who are worried about coronary disease or something else and therefore might have more coronary calcification exercise as a, as a you know, a, a, in the hopes of mitigating that. Um, my read of the epidemiologic data, and Roberto and I were talking about this, is that suggests that going from sedentary to really modest levels of exercise are actually, is associated with a substantial improvement in outcome. You know, even like shockingly low levels of exercise. Um, you know, I forget what it was, averaging five or 10 minutes a day was associated with it. Um, and that the association with, with beneficial outcomes then is pretty flat after that. It's not clear that running marathons or, and then at some point, you know, running 100 miles, you know, I think intuitively seems like it can't be a good thing. So, but there's not, there's not really great data on those because there's no randomized data saying this is it. Um, and as you probably know, in the exercise physiology literature, there's this growing movement to saying, how quick can we make it? So there's the seven minute workout, you know, is that sufficient? But the endpoints they look at are things like conditioning endpoints. Is that the same? You know, and, and yesterday, one of the questions that came up is, you know, is physiologic growth, in fact, the mediator of benefit? Or, or, and my guess is there are distinct pathways, and it may not be the same that, you know, if your skull muscles get bigger and you're happy with that as a 20-year-old, that may not mean that your, your cardiovascular outcomes are improved in the same way. So, so, you know, we really don't know. I mean, personally, you know, I... I you know, I think if you start to exercise enough, you, you begin to get addicted to it. Um, and I think there is a fear of doing too much. But I tend to exercise, you know, sort of five days a week, mostly because I like, I, I don't know if I like how I feel when I do it. I like how I feel when I stop. And, and that's part of it. But, you know, it's a great question, and, and we don't have a great answer, I'm afraid. Yes, Steve. Yeah.
so we haven't done lots of that, but but other people have done you know stuff along those lines, and there, there do seem to be exercise-induced changes in calcium handling and contractility. Again, we haven't revisited that much. We're about to, um, and I think I mentioned this yesterday. We have a cohort of aged animals that are sort of a little over two years old um, that we got from the NIA that where they seem to have a, a, a sort of heft heft phenotype. They have diastolic dysfunction. Um, they have uh, normal systolic function. Um, they appear to have some exercise intolerance. And so now we're training them. And in that cohort, I think it'll be quite interesting. And so we've done initially echoes, MR, and PV loops, and just to document the baseline phenotype. And so now we're trying to see in the aged animals, can we in fact improve calcium handling and other things in a way that would improve diastolic function, which again has been a hypothesis in the human literature for some time, but mostly based on elite athletes, you know, from Ben Levine and other folks who have followed them who, who exercise and compete even at the, you know, at the ages of 65 or, or older who appear to have less stiffening, but again, may just be the people who don't have stiffening who are able to continue competing at that level. But I think it's a really interesting question. There is a literature suggesting, you know, there are benefits, the increases in circa and increases in, in contractility. But we haven't done much of that um, recently, but hope to in this aged cohort where there's clearly a difference in the baseline. So, And Ro I should say, Roger showed years ago that if you put circa back into these aged hearts, you improve diastolic function. So that's part of the hypothesis. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I don't know that I know a really good head-to-head -head comparison. I mean, part of the complexity is there are different gender differences, for example, in the response to ischemia reperfusion. I mean, there are clinical differences that come out, but there's also differences in, in mice. Um, uh, so, so it might be a little bit hard to normalize head-to-head. -head. In the models that we've looked at, we, we do both genders, and, and the effects look very similar. Um, you know, we might be underpowered to see a subtle difference between the genders, but both in the, in the kind of um, physiologic models of exercise, but also the genetic models. And I didn't show all these data, but we've got both male and female cohorts in both of the transgenic lines. When we were intrigued by this, partly because mir 2 2 is encoded on the X chromosome, and we wondered whether there might be a difference. But as best we can tell, and again, a lot of these models are good at picking up really big differences, not so much subtle differences. So we could be missing something. But we see similar, very similar effects in males and, and females, you know, except that the females tend to do a little better in general with ischemia reperfusion. So their survival is a little better, and their imports are a little smaller, and their adverse morale is a little better in, in the mice. Um, but it's, a, it's, it's an interesting question. And we were actually intrigued by the notion there might be some sexual dimorphism. Another pathway, I didn't talk about the activin pathway, which also myosat and activin also change with exercise, does appear to have you know, different gender effects. And so you know, it, it may be that those, there are differences, but they're not explained by these pathways, I guess. Oh, oh my pleasure. Yeah, thanks so much for the invitation. Our, uh, plaque oh, thank you. Smith lecture. Design Wonderful. Design time, your name to meet the John Smith lecture. Oh, thank you so much. much. Thank you. Ah. Oh. <laughs> Wonderful. The, uh, Louis's uh, plaque there ah. in the back. Uh, this is very helpful for Henry and Carlos. They can't see that. And so probably just having it in the room will bring people into line. So that's great. So thank, you you so yes. uh, thank you so much. Yes, wonderful. Oh, and it's so great. That's beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thanks so much. Nice to meet you. They won't ship that to you because they don't have a way to do it. Probably not. Right. Yeah, I wish yeah, I would yeah, have yeah, the ability to do it. No, thank <laughs> you. That would be wonderful. That thank is you. great. Yeah. Thanks. This is very interesting. Oh, good. Well, thank you. Thank you.